try and be a little bit of an inconvenience? I will destroy your life. As we found out that we'd be expecting, not one but two kids, we knew we had to move to a real house with more space. At the time we were still living in a one-bedroom studio one up from the ground floor, with its only entrance being a metal fire escape, stairs. Not ideal for a pregnant woman, let alone to live with two small babies. So, we found a privately leased house that was newly renovated and had all the room and a large garden we were looking for. Signed the lease and immediately collected the keys. As the owner drove off, the woman next door comes up to me, immediately demanding we not make noise before noon as her BF works nights and sleeps in and a whole bunch of other do's and don'ts. So right of the bat knew, trouble incoming. As the house was fully renovated and not much had to be done we were like don't poke the bear, we'll do the things that make noise afternoon. We moved in after two weeks and the whole street was warm and welcoming. My wife was almost due giving birth to my twin daughters and some offer help with anything we needed, real kind people. They also told us about our neighbors. Nobody liked them, he was a big bully and got into arguments with everybody. Also we're known as radio pirates as an illegal broadcasting on radio with all Dutch bangers. This music is just terror on your ears and possibly used on terrorists on black sites, which went alongside them partying Thursday Sunday till 5 in the morning. Loud music, constant yelling, always drunken etc. Really something to look forward to when moving in, certainly with two babies on the way. The partying began immediately, full blast, real classy for someone demanding to be quiet when D-Bag needs his beauty sleep. Then one day my Phil came to put new grass in, he has his trailer parked at the back of our houses which is public space. Not according to him though, know that exact spot where the trailer full with grass sods, quite heavy stuff, was parked was his spot and we had to move the trailer. Not going to happen as I was not planning to walk all the way around the house with the sods. He gets angry right away and demanded me to move it. I told him to go duck himself. I was done with him already then and there. I'm also a ginger so besides having no soul I do have a temper which is always in check until you provoke me repeatedly. Anyone who knows me will tell you that you really had to make an effort for that to happen. We went on working and end of day comes when my Phil wants to leave. Hooks up the trailer and bam, there was D-Bag, telling him off, yelling it's his spot and he better does not do this again or else. Mess with me all you want, I can handle it but what you don't do is threaten my family. I ran outside and told him in no uncertain terms to back off or he'll be the sorry one. Total bluff on my side, yes I have that temper but I'm not impressively built and have no hidden fighting skills, I do fight dirty. He backs off, Phil leaves and I go inside where I find my wife crying. She got scared of him maybe doing something to her father and or me and this is something we don't need right now. Combined with hormones from being pregnant and you can paint that picture. So I'm even more pissed but had to promise not to act on anything. I won't, dear, not yet anyway. Time went on without any real incident and then came the time my wife goes into labor. Didn't go smooth and ended up having to deliver with C-section or whatever it's called. Because daughter too was almost strangled by the umbilical cord. We had to stay three nights, excruciating nights due to a lot of things. Finally we get to go home. Family had put a giant sign in our front yard welcoming the babies. The sign was already up for a few days prior to coming home so our friendly neighbors definitely knew about it. But did they give a flying duck? No, they did not. From the first night on they started to party and broadblasted their terror music, they started at noon and continued to until 5 or 6 in the morning. Classy, they also kept going for days, so it wasn't just Thursday Sunday, it was all week long and the next. So we were broken, hardly slept, one of our daughters suffered from heavy cramps combined with all the noise and her parents at the end of their wits so she cried a lot. And then I just had it. I researched some things on radio pirates, the laws and regulations and on his large, 5 meters plus antenna in his backyard which was illegal in itself, but he used it to illegally broadcast on radio which meant he had a lot of equipment to do so, which was even more illegal and can even get you jailed, but at the very least they could seize it all and fine him big time. In the 1045k area. Now, I did not immediately turn him in but instead were looking for another house to lease first. This because I figured it wouldn't sit well with him and having a wife and two babies in the house alone during the day because I had to go to work. I hear you guys thinking, why not involve the police? Well they are utterly useless in cases like this. We called once and what they did disturbs me to this day. They rang at their doorbell and immediately started off by saying we called them about noise complaints. Yes, you read that right. No protection or whatsoever, just blatantly told them we were the reason they're there, told them to keep it down and that was it. They didn't even follow up with us or anything. As you can guess D-Bag now was even more pissed and told me the next day, or yelled over the fence that separates our backyards that I really should not do that again, a threat yet again of which I told the police. I didn't report it the first time as I chalked it up to alpha male and heat of the moment. But without witnesses to corroborate, nothing could be done yet again. Some days later I walked out the front door and he just stepped out of his car. Came up to me demanding I cut back some of our ivy that grew on our side of the fence because it tangled in with his big hole antenna. He would be gone for some hours and I could come into his garden to cut back the ivy that grew through on their side. And then a light bulb went on above my head. I told him politely that I would do that immediately. Why? Because that gave me the opportunity to find out the make and model of this antenna to ascertain its signal strength, where the cables go exactly and what kind of cables they were, again to know the signal strength it handled. Also, it gave me a good view on the equipment he had, through the window so I could snap some photographs of it. This was the icing on the cake. Because in the meantime we did manage to find a new home and already had signed the lease so we would be gone in two weeks. Luckily we only had to paint some walls for the girls room and furthermore just pack up our things and move them to the other house. 
So after I trimmed the ivy and collected my evidence I went online that night to find out the proper channels to report a broadcast pirate and which entity was tasked with catching said pirate. Turned out I had to call the telecom agency but also the police. Wasn't too happy with the latter but I remembered I have a nephew that works for the police. Officially his area was immigration but knew enough colleagues that could help us and we could trust not to confront them again saying I was the one that sent them. That was extremely important for our safety when doing what I was doing. So I gave both the agency and the police all evidence I collected, pointed them to the frequencies he pirated so they could listen in. Then they started a neighborhood investigation, which wasn't really necessary but this was to cover our asses to make it look like he got caught by accident because they had an active investigation in our area. You never know what he can learn from legal documents and such. We asked them to wait with the raid yes they raid pirates houses, preferably in the early hours of the day because of his beauty sleep rendering him incapable of fleeing or hide evidence etc. We moved two weeks later and they raided him two days after we moved. All of his equipment, computers, radios, cell phones and his car were seized. He left in cuffs, his wife slash GF did too, for making a big scene and tried to interfere. All of which was live reported to me by one of my ex-neighbors who were equally ecstatic about this. It turned out, this wasn't the first time he got caught but his third time, his car had no insurance on it and his mo failed. This would normally have no big consequence because he didn't drive it while raided, but they had the guy surveilled on for a week and that definitely meant he was seen driving it while not having insurance and valid mo. He was fined somewhere around 30k euros, went to jail for 12 weeks and everything seized was destroyed except the car. His GF had to do 40 some hours community service. They had to sell the house, which made for very happy neighbors as they too were over and done with them. Like I said, I do fight, but very dirty. You have to really make an effort for me to get to that point, they did and suffered. Over a year later when shopping groceries I encountered them. With the foulest of looks, if looks could kill I'd be a smoldering heap of ash. But nothing more than that. If you don't do the senior project, then you won't walk graduation. Well alright then. Back in 2013, I was a senior at a high school I had just transferred to. I had moved earlier in the year because my parent got divorced, and I made the deliberate choice to leave my old high school and move in with my dad, attending a new high school. I won't go into much detail about the why, but it was my decision to leave my mom, my old school, and my hometown in the Bay Area, and move into a small apartment with my dad. This comes up later. Normally, switching schools isn't a huge deal, but it was sort of an abrupt move. I wasn't able to take any of the AP classes I normally would have taken because they all had mandatory summer projects that I wouldn't have been able to do in a week. Additionally, a week into the school year, we were told about this stupid senior project they wanted us to do. In a nutshell, there was some acronym like IMPACT or something, and each letter represented a value of the school. They wanted us to write about how IMPACT had influenced us in our time at the school. We were then told that, should we not do the senior project, we wouldn't be able to walk for graduation. I heard this and thought it was stupid for a number of reasons, not the least of which being that I had only just gotten there, so their dumb acronym didn't mean anything to me. I brought this concern up to the lady telling us about the project, and her response was that I just figure something out, or don't walk. Well okay then. I brought it up with my dad, asked if he gave a hot crap whether or not I walked for a high school graduation. He did not, so I just figured that I wouldn't do the project. End of story, right? Wrong. You see, a few months into the senior project, they did a checkup on every senior. We just lined up in our homeroom to talk to some lady from the principal's office and told her how close we were to being done. When I walked up, I told her that I wasn't doing it. She was confused. You're not going to do it? You have to. It's non-negotiable. No it's not. I don't have to do it. But you won't walk if you don't do it. Yeah. Then we just sorta of stared at each other, and she wrote my name down and shooed me away. I correctly assumed that this would not be the last interaction I had regarding this non-issue. Several weeks later, my suspicions were confirmed when I was pulled out of class and brought into the main office. They ushered me into the vice principal's personal office, where she made a bit of a show of pulling out some papers. She told me that the meeting was regarding a misunderstanding I may have had regarding the senior project. She was apparently told that I didn't know what to do for the assignment, and I chose to boycott the whole thing as a result. I quickly corrected her, and explained that I very clearly understood what they wanted me to do, but that I thought it was stupid and wasn't going to do it. I also explained that I understood the penalty, and was fine with it. She, like the first lady, seemed confused by this course of action, and just let me leave, since there wasn't really much of a conversation to be had. A few more weeks later, I get pulled out of yet another class for this same thing. Again, I'm brought up to the vice principal for a one-on-one. -on -one. When I get there, she looks like the cat that ate the canary. She begins, so, I know you were in here a while ago, and you said you didn't want to do your senior project. No, I interrupted, I said I wasn't doing the project. Well, she continued, we had a chat with your mother over the phone earlier this week. She told us that she really wants you to walk on your graduation. I was quiet for a moment. Um. I live with my dad. Right, but your mom said she'd like to attend the ceremony and see you walk. I don't think you get it, I stated. I live with my dad for a reason. If ever there were an expression that perfectly exemplified the dial-up tone, that's the face she made. After she collected herself, I was released and headed back to class. By this point, I was mostly just not doing the project because it was dumb. But them calling a family member to strong arm me was crossing a line. On top of that, they tried to strong arm me using a parent with whom I was no contact. I decided right then that, no matter what, I wasn't caving into their bullcrap. F the project, F the school, F the weird tactics they were trying to use. Though, 
In my anger was also confusion. Why the hell did these people care so damn much about one guy not doing an optional assignment? Also, I made myself very clear, so was that the end of it? Spoiler alert it wasn't. A few more weeks later, I got pulled into the actual principal's office. The principal, for reference, was one of those guys that tried to make a show of being overly friendly and goofy, but to the point where it came off as superficial. When I got to his office, he was his usual extroverted self, greeted me, and sat me down. So, I've heard about this whole senior project problem you've had going on. And I get it. Trust me, I really do, you're new here, so our motto hasn't had as much of an impression. So, after talking about it with the folks grading the projects, we think it'd be just fine if you had a modified project. Just do a project on one letter of impact, and you're golden. He gave me a big warm smile. No, sorry? He asked, still smiling. I'm not doing it. His smile was slowly fading, but you only have to do one letter. It's really not that much. Yeah, I got that. I'm still not going to do it. I stated, but you won't be able to walk on graduation day. Yep. So what's the issue, exactly? You called my mom. His mouth was open like he was going to say something, but I guess nothing came to mind, as we sat in silence for a good 20 seconds, him trying to formulate an argument, and me making a Jim Halpert face. I told him if that was everything he needed to talk about, I would be heading back to class. He didn't protest, so I just left. It was after this meeting that I eventually got some context. Apparently, California schools will shuffle principals around every few years for some reason that probably makes sense, but I don't care enough to research. Our principal was going to be switching schools after the 2013 semester had ended, and one of his big plans was to leave that high school with 100% participation in the senior projects that would otherwise not affect any final grade. He used the threat of preventing students from walking at graduation to bully everyone into doing the dumb project. Almost everyone, I stuck to my guns and refused to do it. And sure enough, after the deadline had passed, they made a big deal about how happy they were that 99.6% of students completed their senior projects, even though they were hoping for 100%. And the absolute dumbest part about this exercise and stupid? After everything was said and done, I was called in one last time to the VP's office. She told me that despite my refusal to do the senior project, they were still going to let me walk, and gave me five tickets for friends and family. I laughed, walked out without the tickets, and didn't attend my own graduation. Everybody must know when he's out of office? Watch how this backfires. So yeah, a couple of years ago I was working for an IT company which also provided server management and general domain and email services. We had some really big companies as clients, so we were used to some really idiotic demands, but most of the time we could convince the people whose main job seemingly was to be in charge to listen to our expertise. Not so Mr. Bigwig. Mr. Bigwig was the CEO of a large automobile sales company. He also was the type of guy who prided himself with being a great negotiator and thinking so far ahead, regular people can't follow. And he was a complete SS to everyone. Mr. Bigwig went on a holiday once and set up an automatic out-of-office reply in his mail account, but, as is the technical standard, everybody who wrote him during that time only received the reply just one single time. When Mr. Bigwig returned from his vacation this infuriated him a lot so he called our support line and yelled and cussed his way up our hierarchy until he had me on the phone. I tried to tell him that this was working as intended and tried to explain why, but Mr. Bigwig wouldn't have any of it. This went all the way to our CTO who sent him a waiver to sign, stating that we would deactivate this limitation, but not be liable for any consequences, in short. Then he told me to make the changes to MB's account. I tried to object, but the CTO just smiled, shrugged and went into his office. Mr. Bigwig was happy. He won and booked this as his latest negotiating victory. Now let us jump to December the 29th of the same year. I get a phone call. From Mr. Bigwig. He is not happy. He is not happy because he is blacklisted on about every blacklist in existence. He is also not happy because he can't receive or send any email. And he is not happy because he can't find any mail he received during the Christmas holidays or near them. He can't find them because the nice number in brackets besides his inbox folder, that indicates the amount of unread mails he has, reads 50,000. A quick look around the server logs tells me there are indeed some mails he did not receive. 150,000 to be exact. They are still pending delivery because his inbox is full. He is also not happy because he is the laughing stock of everybody he ever respected. Now let me guide you as the reader to the bottom of this. What you don't know and we also did not know at the time is, Mr. Bigwig was member of a very exclusive group of business owners, CEOs and high-ranking politicians around the globe. The kind of people you would imagine sitting around a large oak table, smoking cigars, drinking 200 euros whiskey and discussing world dominance. This group had a mailing list. A crappy, basic mailing list. It went something like this. Bigwig says hey, thank you for your mail, but I am on holiday. I will reply later. Summerondome dude writes Merry Christmas. Mailing list emails Hey guys, Summerondome dude is wishing you Merry Christmas. Bigwig writes Thanks for telling me, but I am on holiday. I will reply later. Mailing list telling everybody Hey guys, Mr. Bigwig is on holiday, he will reply later. Bigwig email goes Thanks for telling me, but I am on holiday. I will reply later. Mailing list adding effing everybody. Hey guys, Mr. Bigwig is on holiday, he will reply later. Repeat until the servers give out. So be Diddy was not the only one who had thousands and thousands of mails in his folder. All his fancy pants networking contacts had too. Mr. Bigwig raged hard at everyone who was brave enough to get on the phone with him, threatened to sue us for millions of euros and to end us as a business. We finally put him through to our founder, 
who listened to his rant and told him he would send him a solution within the next 10 minutes. He sent two documents, a scan of the signed waiver, in which the consequences of disabling the out-of-office message restriction were outlined in detail, and a service contract, allowing us to fix the problem to our abilities without any financial budget limitations, but with a really nice, red, enormous, estimated budget. It was a good year for the company, with an unexpected spike in revenue, just before New Year's Eve. Lie to me? Watch how I deport you. So I work in customer support for a mobile network provider. The way our company works is that after training, you enter a one-month testing period where you answer phone calls under close supervision. At the end of the testing period, they either let you go or transfer you to a permanent position on one of the teams. I was a few days away from the end of the testing period when I get one heck of a phone call. I spent more than an hour on that one, it hurt my final score at the end of the month. The customer told a tall tale about how when she was trying to pay her debt to the company, she racked hundreds of shekels worth of debt and unincluded uses. The sales representative was rude to her and refused to let her pay so she took a picture of him and left. The reason the call took so long is because she kept telling the story out of order, adding and changing details and going on tangents and rants. It was very difficult to get the story straight. I felt like a detective trying to piece together the clues into what actually happened. Every time I read the story back to her chronologically she added or changed something in the middle or went on a tangent about how she's a polite British woman and we shouldn't hire people like that representative to represent our company. Eventually, I got her to settle down on a version of what happened. I looked through the records and saw that according to the representative, who was a lot more concise than her, she was the one being rude, yelling at him in English, a language he barely spoke, and taking his picture without his consent. I didn't tell her that. I just politely instructed her on how to pay her debt via the phone. She sounded nervous. I told her that until the debt is paid I cannot make the changes in the account including adding a report. So reluctantly she gave me her credit card details and the debt was paid in full. I reported on what she told me and moved it along to my superiors. A few days later my testing period was over and despite the tragedy of a call I aced it and got transferred to the illustrious email department, which is what I wanted. It's much more chill here and I can work at my own pace, not having to rely on the customer or the supervisor to work faster. Also, I could take my breaks whenever I felt like it. Everything is fine for a couple of weeks until I receive a new email telling a familiar tale. It was an enraged recounting of the same story I heard on the phone, except much more elaborate, with more details I never heard before, such as the involvement of another person, or that the representative assaulted the customer by trying to impede her exit from the store. The customer complained that she's been cheated, and expected the representative to be fired, but she saw him again at the store and was outraged. She was under the impression that her paying her debt meant we will listen to her and fire the representative. The email ends with the following demands, fire the representative, reimburse her for the money we stole from her under false pretenses, apologize to her in the form of extra compensation and a personal phone call from a high-ranking manager, if we did not comply, the police will get involved. So I complied with the second part, and we got the police involved. You see, while reading the email I noticed that the address she emailed us from had a different surname than her account or the credit card information she provided. And lo and behold, the email was actually her real name while the other details were fake. Turns out she was indeed a polite British woman, a British woman overstaying her visa for over a year that was now using a fake identity in Israel. How's that for false pretenses, dumb butt? As we discovered later, she was also wanted for numerous accounts of fraud where she didn't pay for services or claim compensation for stories that later turned out to be false. Just like she tried to do with us. We called the police but they couldn't find her since the physical address she registered on our site was also fake. So we called her back to the store to apologize personally. She gladly obliged. The police were waiting for her. Neither I nor the representative she implicated were there that day, unfortunately, so we didn't get to see the look on her face. She was fined a hefty amount and then deported back to the UK. Allergies are not important to the Home Depot. In high school, I was working at the local Home Depot as a head cashier. I kept track of all the active registers and made sure things ran smoothly. I held this position for quite some time one to two years, and enjoyed it pretty well. Customers were nice, and my co-workers were mostly craftsmen and gardeners, all with interesting stories to share. I am allergic to nearly every form of pollen. I mean every form. I take allergy medication, but even then if I am in close proximity to flowers for too long, 30 minutes, I will begin to break out in hives and throw up most of the time. So after about three months working in the winter, the spring season was upon us, the worst season for my allergies. One day, about three of our garden section cashiers called off sick. They are pretty reliable people so I had no problem finding people to cover for them. As I come to my manager to inform them of the position changes, my manager looks at me and says you can handle the garden section on your own, can't you? I inform my manager that I could cover it for at most 15 minutes before my allergies flare up and I'll have to leave. He states we don't have any documents on file that state you are not fit to work in the garden section. So unless you come to me with a doctor's note stating your allergies, I couldn't give less of a F. I don't know who crap in his Cheerios that morning, but I complied, saying I want to be sure of what you are asking, you want me to work in a section which is hazardous to my health instead of placing equally capable employees in that section? Did I stutter? He said okay, sure, I said I make my way down to the garden section, and immediately my eyes are stinging. 
I decide that I'm going to stick it out for my boss's sake, no matter how crappy my service becomes. The first 10 minutes are pretty uneventful, but then a customer asks me about the rash on my arms. The Home Depot does not care about allergies. I say as I do not have official paperwork this customer looks extremely concerned, asking for my manager's name. At this point, I was feeling nausea hit me, I throw up in the trash can at the register, turn back to smile, as well as I could, and say I work under Bob. The customer reassures me that I will be okay, and tells me I should head home. Turns out, this guy, Nick, was a higher up at the Home Depot's regional management and was my boss's boss. So, naturally, I comply with the chain of command and head to the locker room to pack up. As I am packing, Bob comes in, fuming and cursing, telling me I have no right to leave yet and that my shift is not over for another five hours. I simply say Nick told me to go home Bob's face gets redder as he threatens to fire me, saying I was lying and tells me to go back out. I comply, knowing that I will see Nick on my way out. I pass Nick, still in the orange apron, and he asks me where I am going. I say that Bob told me to go back to work. Nick's expression goes from concerned to furious, as he takes my apron from me and tells me I'll be paid for the full shift and to go home. I come into work the next day to see that Bob's nameplate has been removed from the office. I ask our HR rep what happened, and apparently, after I had left, Nick stormed Bob's office and proceeded to perform an audit on all of his past employee complaints. This guy had been throwing out complaints for the past five years. Needless to say, there was an opening for the store management position, and I was given a week's vacation for my troubles. My satisfaction was huge. Racist bigot gets arrested because he thinks a woman can't fix computers. Southerner comes into the computer store wanting a man to fix his computer. He gets the worst experience of his life. Back in 2006, I worked for one of those big box stores that had an IT desk, formerly known as NerdHerd LOL, where people could bring devices in to get serviced if there was a problem. We were located in Columbus, GA, which is right over a bridge from Phoenix City, Alabama. This is important because, where our store was placed, we would normally get a lot of servicemen and women coming up from Fort Benning who were generally pretty cool. But we would also get folks, mostly from Alabama, who were, let's just say, slightly unfavorable to folks of a certain skin color or gender. Now, I'm a 5 feet 1 inch girl who, at the time, weighed a total of 120 pounds soaking wet. I was practically a hobbit. I was also one of the lead technicians in the department. I was the one the new hires went to if they were confused or couldn't troubleshoot certain problems. The team I worked with was amazing. The store's general manager was great and my department supervisor was the man. I would regularly go out for drinks with these people. One of the best places I've ever worked, even though it was retail. One day, I'm working the counter to check customers in and do evaluations and diagnostics to give an estimate of what the repair price would be. In comes. Let's call him Joe. He wore a cut-off t-shirt, worn denim jeans, and a baseball cap with a confederate flag on it that just barely covered his business in the front, party in the back haircut. I am not one to judge on looks. I've had plenty of people come in looking precisely the same way this guy did, who have been an absolute delight to work with. Never judge a book by its cover, kids, but I still have my defenses up, just in case. I really hoped it wasn't going to go the not-so-friendly route. I was unfortunately wrong about Dear Joe. Joe walks up to the counter with his PC tower and practically slams the unit on the desk. Joe says I need this fixed. It's broken. Okay. Sir, let me have a look and I'll see if I can Joe cuts me off and stares at me with a disgusted look on his face. Excuse me? I tell him if you give me a moment, sir, I'll be able to take a look at your computer and Joe screams aw oh, hell no. It was at this point that I realized where this was inevitably going to go wrong. I tell him unfortunately, sir, I won't be able to give you an estimate if you don't let me diagnose your computer. He says there is no way in hell a woman knows about computers. I'm not letting you touch my computer. Get me the manager. Oh, yes, I thought. This is going to be effing awesome. I'm sure he wanted to talk to the general manager of the store, but I couldn't resist. Cue malicious compliance. I could have pulled the I'm the manager thing, because I was one of the senior staff, but my direct boss was actually out back working on repair projects and I couldn't help but get excited about how this was going to go down. Of course, sir. Right away, sir. Mike, my supervisor, the guy who ran our department, and not the general manager of the store, was elbow deep in a motherboard replacement when I walked in and gave him the biggest, poop-eating grin. Hey, Mike, there's a guy out there asking for the manager. He looks at me confused because he was just supervisor, but I then proceeded to tell him exactly what was waiting for him out front. His face split into the brightest smile, he then proceeded to walk out to the front. Have I mentioned that Mike is a 6 feet 3 inches, 280 pounds black man who looked like he could eat a Mack truck for lunch? He was such a big, lovable, teddy bear. We all adored him. The moment Mike stepped out, the customer freaked. Hello, sir, I hear there's a problem? Joe lost IT. It start with F no before devolving into a racist tirade that I had never witnessed in my life. I'm from Massachusetts, so this was awful, yet amazing to watch. Like a car crash, I just couldn't look away. Not that we have no racism in the Northeast, but damn. Joe kept screaming, using the nastiest slur, you know the one, repeatedly while staff and customers watched in blatant horror. Security ended up having to come over to try to calm the man down. Our entire security team was black as well so, naturally, Joe went even more crazy. Eventually, the police had to be called because the man was threatening me, calling me a cunt and a bitch, and threatening security and my boss, using that word that is not okay. My general manager got called out of his office and immediately called the police to have the man removed. 
God bless whichever dispatcher who received the call was, because they dispatched two black officers to the scene. Me and my general manager were literally the only white people involved in this train wreck, aside from bigoted Joe, and I watched with unbridled glee as Joe was cuffed and taken away by the police. Watching Joe foam at the mouth as he was dragged away made my whole week. Thank you for the entertainment, bigoted Joe. His name was Charles, he was the definition of I have no enemies. Working McDonald's drive through no speaker, two order windows and a third pickup window. Charles is working window one. I'm working window two. Charles is black, ripped, tall, huge, has prison tats all down his arms, somewhere between half an ounce or two of fat on his body. Picture Terry Crews with darker skin and black tats to the wrists. Charles is equal parts charming, soft-spoken, humble, and ambitious. He knew where he had been and was determined to change his life. Probably one of the best men I'll have ever met. Enter green minivan. We had both taken orders at the same time and mine was long gone. Charles order was taking forever. Probably four minutes just taking the order before payment. I come over to check on Charles. Before I get close I notice he's blocking the frame of the window so I can't hear anything. It's an awkward position for him and blatantly obvious. He moves his hand out to me out of sight of the van and gives me the stop sign. Back off. Got it. Time passes. Manager on duty comes out to check the issue. He waves her off. She protests. I tell her to wait and see. Something is deeply wrong. Suddenly, Charles points the van down to the other window and leaps into action. Slams the window, shoves past us without a word, and races to the third window. Manager and I look at each other, check for other cars, none, then follow at a distance. Manager had been running the order but Charles took over and personally handled every part of the order with the speed of a madman and quality of a five-star restaurant. He grabs a new batch of fries. He has the cook triple check each burger. He breaks a cardinal rule of the store and shows the van all the kids meal toys we have for personal preference. Drinks and condiments are handed out and Charles gives them a genuine smile and enthusiastically thanks them for being customers. Have a great night. We'll see you soon. Charles waits until they are out of sight before returning from the window and visibly shaken, walks back to his register. Manager starts to fuss about an explanation she's owed but Charles just says he can't yet. His legendary Zen calm is severely damaged. After a few minutes to get a drink, wipe the sweat off his face and compose himself he opens up. Van had rolled up. Charles had greeted them with the usual, welcome to McDonald's, what can I get for you this evening? And his winning smile. White father driving waits for Charles to finish and with a loud sneer had turned to the wife and for all to hear said, you order, hun. I don't talk to monkeys. Wife turns to the two young kids, probably eight and ten. Impressionable. Learning. Watching. They had locked eyes on Charles. They'd seen his tats. They'd listened to the hateful otherizing of those people from birth. Charles decided that he had it within him to reach for something better. Father be damned, he's long gone. Charles decided that he had a message for those boys. The wife patiently and sheepishly took the excruciatingly and needlessly complicated order from the father and then had to speak past him to Charles. Same for the kids. Light mustard. Three pickles. Etc. Perfectionism. Charles reached down inside himself for something that neither I nor the manager possessed and he gave the wife a genuine smile as he whipped out the order. The father knew he had been served a dish he thought impossible to serve. It was served with kindness and compassion and a compliance that defied everything he'd told them about those people. The kids both waved to Charles from the back of the van as the father pulled away. They liked their new friend. Racist former manager made my life hell, so you won't believe how I got her fired. I was desperate to join a new job after my husband and I were both laid off last year. When I was offered a new role, I knew it would be a step down from what I was doing but the manager and the team seemed great, and that part has not changed. However, since my manager Gary was so busy, he basically offloaded me to another manager Jane. I was supposed to be the connection point between my team and Jane, but it quickly became Jane micromanaging me. She would ask me to work through lunch, move and or cancel vacation days, call at 11 p.m. on weekends, and order me around on phone calls. She also made nasty comments about my weight and said I was big for my race. The list of personal slights so long that it filled three pages. I would talk back to her and she did not like that, and that provoked her more. I only stayed because we needed to pay the bills. Finally, I had a mental breakdown on a Friday afternoon. After she yelled at me for something trivial about scheduling a meeting without including someone from her team who I didn't know about. I was dealing with a family tragedy and couldn't take it anymore. I told Gary about the situation with Jane and he was sympathetic and not at all surprised considering half her team quit. He immediately offered to move me to a different team under him. I was thrilled. Well, turns out going to the new team didn't help. Jane continued to order me around from afar. When I ignored her emails, she came to my desk one day and started loudly talking about how I am not qualified for this role. Gary overheard and finally told her off, but the verbal abuse did not stop. After two months there, I abruptly wrote my resignation letter and stapled the list of Jane's offensive comments, and ceased everyone. Gary offered a bunch of accommodations to try to keep me, but seeing how she was still provoking from afar, I said the only way for me to stay would be for her to go and he did not have authority to let her go. Her manager was in a different country and despite several HR complaints from at least five people, nothing was done. So I left, loudly and without shame, telling everyone exactly why I was leaving. Times were very bad for three months. There were nights we would eat slices of bread just so we could pay the mortgage and emergency expenses from a health crisis and a funeral. Even after he found a job, we were still catching up on bills and still are. I spent months applying to 5 to 10 roles per day, sometimes over 20. Last month, 
I saw a public memo about a big shot from a former company joining the company I just left. I used to work with this guy closely and texted him a congrats. Let me know if you need any insights on the new place. We had a quick call where I told him some ins and outs, where I thought they could innovate. After this call, he asked me to join the team as his chief of staff. I accepted. Imagine Jane's shock when we had our first all hands call. All the VPs and above were asked to welcome the new Big Shot in a giant conference room. In Big Shot's speech, he breezed over that I'll be his chief of staff, along with a few key names. I now sat two levels above Jane and apparently, within the three months I was not there, the other half of her team turned over. Every single person left. Gary was excited for me and said all nice things. However, Jane took the classless route and sent Big Shot an email about how I'm an unqualified idiot, that I used to work for her, how I tried to get her fired, and that she suspects I lied to get ahead. She didn't even try to be fake nice. Big Shot forwarded me her email and asked what this was about. I was so nervous and excited. Little did Jane know, I was a director at Big Shot's competitor company and was already a level above her, so two levels isn't a big leap, and I worked with him for five years. I had an hour call with Big Shot and told him she was bad for the company culture and was a nasty person in general, but the evidence he needed was Gary confirming that her whole team has turned over, my prior resignation letter which was still sitting on my desktop when I logged in upon return, and a few other nasty emails she sent her recent staff, which they were happy to share with us. Big Shot fired Jane on Friday. Karen assaults a pregnant woman, so you won't believe what happens next. I used to be a service manager at one of the biggest locations of a popular Mexican grill. I won't say which but guac was $1.95 extra and we were required to ask everyone if they were okay paying that price. One Sunday morning our second busiest shift of the week two of my line people called out so we were struggling to get all of our prep done before opening at 11. We are just wrapping up when in comes Karen 10 minutes before opening through the side door marked employees only with 15 preteen girls in tow. My cook recognizes her as she regularly comes in during the dinner shift and is extremely abusive and cruel to all the Latino workers. Karen tells me they can order whatever they want, throws her credit card at me and goes to sit down at a table and diddle on her phone. Now I can't ring up her order without her standing there because of the company rules and I am 30 weeks pregnant and just want to take my break. I prego waddled over to Karen's table to try and inform her of that when she literally flicks her hand at me to dismiss me. Not only have I been at the store since 7 and done two different people's jobs on top of my own, I have my son's head grinding against my pelvic bones and kicking me like crazy. I am in no mood. When I try to tell her again, she looks at me with what I can only describe as seething contempt and says what part of they can get whatever they wanted you not understand. I don't care what you charge me as long as I get a receipt. Don't interrupt me again or I'll get your fat ass fired. Now I never cry but that almost got me. Motherhood is awesome but pregnancy sucks. I finally managed to pick my jaw off the ground and stammer all right. Ma'am, I'll ring up whatever they want and bring you a receipt. The girls were really nice and most of them ordered double meat and they all got a bottled water and chips and guac. Every. Last. One. My cashier and I are just vibrating with glee as we ring them up and watch the bill climb to like $250. I brought the bill to Karen and was pretty excited when she didn't immediately check it. I made my own food and told the cook to come get me when the show starts. I'm halfway done eating when I see him waving to the camera, howling with laughter so I head up. Karen is foaming at the mouth screaming for the manager and when she sees that that manager is me, she literally grinds her teeth and slaps her receipt on the table. She manages to choke out the word refund. The girls have all pretty much finished their food so I inform her that I won't be doing that because I would lose my job for giving away that much critical inventory, meat, guac, cheese, for free. Then I gently remind her that she told me twice that they could get anything as long as she got a receipt. She just keeps demanding a refund and calling me stupid and fat, again, pregnant. At this point, her screaming is holding up the very long line and customers are shouting at her to just leave. That's when she pushed me. Effing hard. My cashier caught me so I didn't fall down but two of our regulars, who are police, see it and immediately cuff her. In this state, any use of physical force against a pregnant woman is classified as aggravated battery or something like that. I felt bad for the kids and I was fine so I kept telling them I didn't want to press charges but they said that at that point it didn't matter because the woman had done it in front of on-duty officers so she getting arrested. They had to call the kids' parents to come get them because she was their church's youth leader and get statements. My GM came in and let me go home with a full day's pay. She tried to take the case to trial but they had video and like 20 witness statements so she ended up taking a couple years probation or something. All because I did exactly what she told me to. Think I'm a kid and bully me at Target? Watch how I find you and ruin your lives. I am a really short and skinny 20-something who could pass for a 12-year-old easy. This is relevant I promise. A while back when this happened I was at Target with my younger sister waiting for our nail appointment. Normal day sister bonding stuff. I think it was 30 minutes in, when we found some ugly jackets in the menswear section and started trying them on for fun. Next thing I know, three girls in volleyball uniform surround us. First thing I notice is two of the three girls were filming us while one girl is asking rapid fire questions while holding a jacket up. I was so surprised and sort of speechless. My sister was also sort of stunned and silent the whole time. Rando girl says hey, do you think this looks good on me? Holds a jacket up, sure. I guess rando girl is like really? Yes? Okay. Buy it for me. She says, are you serious? She says you said you thought it looked good. Buy it for me. I'm like, no. We sort of went back and forth of me saying no and her insisting I buy her the jacket. Her friends filming also pitched in saying I should buy her the jacket and saying if I don't buy her the jacket then I lied about it looking good on her.
What? Can someone explain to me why they did this? Is this some sort of social media prank? At the same time, I am slowly walking out of the menswear section and pushing my sister trying to get away. I could see my little sister was super uncomfortable and I know she is kind of shy so this is really mortifying for her, that made me angry. It also occurred to me that they must think I'm some sort of preteen like them because I can't fathom these type of kids bothering anybody within single hair of puberty. Honestly, they were all pudgy little asshole 10 year olds. Meanwhile, I'm wearing my crooked glasses, messy jeans and a YMCA summer camp shirt, I'd why I even own this t-shirt since I never went to their summer camp. My little sister is also wearing her middle school track shirt, so both of us look like kids, kids like them. In my most grown ass voice I could muster I say, what, the, f, r, you, guys, doing? I'm 20 plus years old, do you think this is funny? What the f is wrong with you kids, where's your moms? In my best I need to speak to a manager voice I ask my sister, go find an employee. My sister takes off running. This is where the girls stop laughing and start telling me to chill out and it's just a prank which only makes me angrier. I go in on them about how so stupid they're being and how harassing strangers is decidedly not funny. I throw in some choice swear words and I can hear my crazy voice getting higher and angrier. I pull my phone out and start recording them and laughing manically saying, think this is funny? Ha ha ha, I think this is where they started getting worried because they took off. I tried following them, but then then an employee following my sister appeared. I go on to explain how we were shopping and suddenly harassed by these three girls trying to force us to buy them things and filming us. I think I also tear up and the employee radios his manager. I repeat my story and show them the photos I took of little craps, sans my crazy video. Next thing I know those asshole kids are rounded up and surrounded by a couple employees and a really annoyed mom. I walk past and tell them to EFF off and drag my sister to our nail appointment. But I wasn't done. They were wearing bright yellow volleyball jerseys with their club names. I google and find said club and blast any email I can find. I also message their Facebook. But. I'm still not done. I go on social media and stalk through their photos. I find the club's Instagram and after some work, I find their friends who have tagged some moms. Through those moms I find their moms. I cross-reference Facebook and see the girls' parents with pictures of their families. I confirm the faces of the little assholes. I blast their social media with my disappointed and upset grown-up voice. I include their pictures. I also find the mom who was chaperoning the kids and I blast her too. I wait. Within hours I have a reply from the director of the volleyball club and replies from two of the parents. The mom who was chaperoning funnily enough blocked me. I never got a direct apology from those craps, but I hope having a stranger hunting them down and contacting people from their lives scared them straight. To top it off, I posted a glowing review of the target on how they handled the situation with little craps faces. A week later, one of the dads asked me to take it down, so I oblige. He asked very nicely, lesson, don't be little craps to people. I made my high school chemistry teacher with lung cancer lose his job. I went to a ghetto high school in a poor community, but my parents raised me to work my ass off so I could get out of there. My parents never went to college, but because of this, myself and my siblings have all gone to good schools out of state. I maintained a 4.0 until the year in question in high school, taking 5 advanced courses a year, out of 6 total, with the last 6th not offering an honors alternative. I learned to get very little sleep because of the amount of work these courses required, and because my school didn't have tutoring aids or anything of the like didn't understand something? Tough SHT, get to googling. So in one of my upperclassmen years, I signed up for an advanced chemistry course. I knew it would be hard, but assumed like the rest of my courses that if the class was minimally structured and Google came through per usual, I would be fine. Other students warned me not to take the course, but since I wanted to go to college for chemistry I knew I had to go through with it. The teacher was horrible, he was old, which is fine, and didn't offer after-class support, which was normal, but also didn't even offer in-class support. His answer to even basic questions was you should understand that, talk to me about it later, but later never came. He didn't offer lunch hours, didn't offer after school hours, and in class would just put up the answers, which were already available online and in the back of the book. My family didn't have fancy tutor money, and none were readily available in my community anyways. I studied my ass off, but when the first test came back I had a D, with no notes to even understand what I had done wrong. When I went to speak with him about it right after class ended, missing part of my next course in the process, he simply told me to look more closely at the textbook for help, and that he didn't have time for me. He was two weeks behind the explanations that he did give, because he was constantly distracted. All of this is bad, but didn't deserve him being fired yet. What did was when he got dangerous. In an experiment working with hydrochloric acid, a plug held the concentrated stuff in a tube with some magnesium, and reacted to form hydrogen bubbles. Well, one of the other students in my group didn't plug the thing properly, and the plug fell out, with the MG being stuck in the tube, now without the HCL. So I asked him how to get the tube back, expecting him to tell us to discard the HCL solution, rinse with water, and start over. I'd read the safety section in my textbook, which had this approach to working with acids. His response? He insisted that I stick my ungloved hand in the solution and just grab the plug, and then still in the solution plug it back in. He wouldn't even put his own hand in to do it, so my high school self thought this was an inherently bad idea. I took some more MG from the workbench, and kept adding it to the solution until it stopped reacting, eating up all the HCL to just leave water. And it kept getting worse. One day he brought what he claimed were illegal fireworks into the classroom, and started setting them off. 
He thought it was funny to point them at us, wearing no safety equipment or goggles, and hoodies that could have easily caught the fury things. He frequently would leave the room while a group of high school kids were playing with Bunsen burners and caustic chemicals. So in combination with the total lack of education I was getting, I didn't feel safe. Did I mention he was a misogynist too? I'm a girl, by the way. All of the boys got A's on tests, with no explanations. He even lost one of the other boys' tests, and straight up said in front of me and the rest of the class that we would just give him an A, assuming that he had done well. Later on I had asked the other student for help understanding something, and even he didn't know what was going on in the course, so I knew it was just bullsh tea. Every other girl I asked was getting the same inexplicable grades as I was. This wasn't unusual on its own either, as I lived in a very conservative area and had several misogynist teachers. Just usually they'd at least still grade fairly. Last thing my high school teachers union had negotiated for tenure. After coming to college, I've learned that this is a very unusual thing, and in retrospect it's an idiotic thing. This chemistry teacher was tenured, which meant that there was basically no way to fire him. Honestly, I felt bad for the bitter old man, because after a botched surgery he was constantly in pain. He was still teaching because he refused to retire, and he had a son going through college that he needed to pay for. But at a certain point, this was affecting my chances of getting into college. I wasn't about to let one man's issues affect prospects for the rest of my life. So I looked up recording laws for my state, and found that it was a one-party consent state meaning that I could legally record my teacher audio ally as long as the campus didn't say anything against it. They had no policies, and I was one of the parties consenting. So for a month, with my grade tanking despite hours of studying and three study books on the course, I recorded him. I recorded his fireworks, his lambasting female students, his crying in the back chemical storage room leaving us unsupervised. I recorded the three times he had left campus inexplicably, leaving the front office to send a last minute substitute to open the door and let us in. You know the 15 minutes and I'm legally allowed to leave meme? That was a constant joke for my class. And then, I made a throwaway Gmail to make a throwaway Dropbox account, big at the time. I uploaded everything, and emailed it to my superintendent with the ultimatum that if something wasn't done I would email the recordings to the local news, and that I really didn't want to do that. Within a day I heard back, with her assuring me that I wouldn't be punished for ratting him out. My parents, her, and myself met. We went over my grades, my unmarked tests and homework, and the videos. They asked me first to talk over my concerns with the teacher, and I said I was uncomfortable with that given his treatment of female students. The superintendent said she wouldn't tell the teacher who had submitted the evidence, but that they needed to speak with him about the concerns to hear his side of the story. My parents and I said that was completely reasonable, as long as my name was never mentioned. The next day, the teacher said he needed to speak with me after class alone. I told him I couldn't as I had another course after that, and he said that it was important. I turned my phone's recorder again right before the class ended, and as I was packing up he approached me. Due to the shape of the classroom, I was literally backed into a corner, and would have had to push this man to the side to get out. He then started saying that one of the students in the course had brought unfounded concerns and lies to the administration about what was going on in the course, and that he knew we hadn't always gotten along well but that he hoped I wouldn't have done that to him. I lied through my teeth and said that I didn't know what he was talking about, that he was making me uncomfortable by blocking my access to the door, and that I was late for my next class. He didn't even deny what I was saying, just said that since I clearly had a problem with him, he'd be willing to stay after class to help me specifically, since it seemed like I was struggling so much. After that I told him I really needed to get to my next course, and he finally moved. I emailed the superintendent that recording during my next course, and cc'd my parents. My parents were furious, the superintendent was mad too because while my parents were poor they dressed up nicely. My mom was an expert in bluffing about getting a lawyer, that we totally couldn't afford, so a liability lawsuit was probably ringing through the lady's mind. Since the district couldn't fire him, he was put on immediate permanent medical leave. While the district was still paying his full pay, they gave us one unqualified substitute after another. Two months before the national exam for the course, they gave us a female teacher that they had pulled out of retirement, but that had actually taught the advanced chemistry course for years. She was a godsend, and even held eight-hour Saturday classes so that we could catch up with the curriculum at least enough to pass the class. In those two months, we covered just enough of the test material that our class had a 50% pass rate, according to my upperclassmen friends, this was a lot higher than it had been for their years, with less than 10% of the class passing. The superintendent also wrote me a thank you college recommendation letter, partially to keep me quiet and partially because they had been trying to get rid of this guy for years. My little sister took this course a couple of years after me, and said that the new teacher was competent, and they were still at that 50% pass rate. Steal all my work and get the credit? Enjoy getting your life ruined. So my friend over in Korea studies fashion design. She sometimes sends me over the sketches of the designs, and they all look amazing. Then again, I'm not into fashion. She is particularly interested in designing handbags and purses. She told me a story about how she shut down one of the most entitled, self-centered, lazy students on campus. At first, Grace and Jane got along just fine. They were both interested in similar stuff, and quickly became BFFs. Grace decided to show Jane her sketches and designs for handbags and purses, and Jane was so impressed by it, because the sketches were in incredible detail, including all the patterns and sew lines, coupled with figurative measurements. Even Professor was impressed by it, and it was no surprise that Grace got a high mark on their first major exam. Jane didn't do so well, 
and practically followed Grace everywhere to get pointers on how to do better. So Grace decided to help her out. Unfortunately, Jane turned out to be one of the most entitled, lazy, and selfish people that Grace has ever met. Things that Jane did to piss Grace off included, but not limited to, not paying attention being late on their study session never showed appreciation didn't pay for coffee or snack complaining annoyingly about how hard it was to draw something Grace pretty much gave up on her after a week, refusing to meet Jane outside of her class. Time went by and for their midterm, everyone in the class had to do a presentation on the stuff they had designed. When it was Jane's turn, Grace was shocked to see Jane had stolen one of her designs. Thankfully Grace had multiple designs going on so there were no conflicts when it was her turn to present, but she was seething with rage. Grace had a meeting with the professor afterwards, and the professor knew what was going on, but couldn't really do anything with Jane because it turns out she was the daughter of the chairman, or one of the major investors, Grace said she can't recall. The chairman apparently blackmailed the professor into giving Jane the best grades professor did, however, helped Grace devise a plan to humiliate and expose Jane. For the finals, the professor announced to the class they would do another presentation, but it would be three designs and advised they had to bring their A games because professionals from industries would be grading their work, and the head of the department and the chairman would be there as well. So you know how Grace had a bunch of sketches for the class? Well, Grace also had a separate sketchbook that had designs from major brands, MK, Coach, you name it. She never used these directly for class assignments, but rather as inspirations for her designs. Grace pretended to be all friendly with Jane again, and brought the other sketchbook on their meetings, still putting up with all the problems mentioned above. Grace secretly worked tirelessly on her new design, and did her best to keep it a secret from Jane. So the day of the final presentation arrives, and Grace and Professor are grinning because they know what is about to happen. Grace went first, and she got a lot of praise from the judges. After a few more presentations, the last one to go was Jane. Jane's presentation turned out to be another copycat, copying designs of not one, not two, but three different companies. After the presentation, this was how it went all down, at least according to Grace. Judge 1 says so, you are saying you designed all these by yourself, right? Jane's like that's right Judge 1 states, and you swear that it really was your design, and didn't copy off from anything else, right? I swear Judge 1 tell her, you are aware your designs are from, three brands, huh? Jane says Judge 1 says are you aware that these are on market right now, and some of the most popular designs? Wait, hold on Judge 2, is like yeah, I was going to bring this up, if you had worked for any brands, you would have probably been fired or worse case, sued Jane is like but Judge 2 destroys her please, I am not done yet, did you honestly think this would work? We have been in the industry for over 10 years. We know a copycat when we see it. She then says but these aren't even my designs. They are from Grace. Judge 3 goes to Grace saying is this true? Yes, but I'd never use them for major projects nor call them my work. I just use sketches of them as inspirations for my own designs. Judge 3 believes it saying, well, that was clear from your presentation. Turning back to Jane, now, Miss Jane, this is a clear case of plagiarism, and I do hope your school is merciful on this matter. After the presentation was over, the chairman screamed at the professor in front of everyone, not realizing he just revealed all the blackmailing and the secret grade deal. Jane tried to call out Grace on how you screwed me over, but it really didn't matter. No one listened to Jane's attempt and slander, and was kicked out of the school. Chairman pretty much lost all support and had to resign, and was replaced by far more honorable and competent one. Guy tries to scam me, only for me to actually scam him. Years ago, I was quite involved in an active online community of analog audio hobbyists. People would occasionally put hardware and music up for sale on the message board we used. I'd been looking for a specific piece of hardware for several years to no avail. It was extremely rare and had never been sold in the US, so any examples would have been imported from Japan. One of these machines popped up for sale from someone in the community and I jumped on it. The guy offering it wasn't new but wasn't terribly active. Somehow he'd obtained picks that weren't on the net and or not easily searchable and ginned up a fake Japanese bill of sale. In hindsight, he may have seen one for sale and stolen the images from that. Regardless, it all seemed legitimate enough to induce me to go through with the transaction. So, PayPal sent and he says it'll ship in about a week. Then, the excuses begin. From he's been busy to out of town to his assistant shipped it but didn't send the tracking number to providing a fake tracking number. Then, he just quit responding to calls or emails. Turns out the number he'd given me was a forwarding service that he subsequently disconnected. He also disappeared from the forum. He had, however, used his real name and a real PayPal account. I filed a PayPal claim, and of course they denied the claim on some technicality. I'm sure he was counting on this occurring. This is where the revenge begins with an unintended bonus. All I wanted was to make sure the guy knew I'd find him and get to him. I'd called the police and reported matters but they couldn't have given less of a damn. I decided to find him myself, and found an old wedding announcement that had been posted on the net. I searched his wife's name and found mention of her being out on leave to give birth to their first child on her work website. Bingo, I had a small gift sent to her workplace with my name on it, and called her work to say that I'm an old friend and don't have their contact info but wanted to wish them congratulations on the new child, and that I'd come see him soon. I had visions of his wife saying how nice it is that someone sent a gift to her work, etc. and asking who I was. This apparently spooked him, because a cashier's check showed up for the full amount. Now, what he hadn't counted on, and I didn't tell him, was that I'd filed a charge back with American Express after PayPal denied the claim. 
My conundrum was this, the Amex investigation was ongoing, and I had no idea if they'd overturn the chargeback or not. I also had no idea if the cashier's check was legit. I've heard of counterfeit checks being returned up to 45 days later, so I truly didn't intend to profit off this. But I did. The Amex chargeback was resolved in my favor, which PayPal clawed back from his account, shortly after the check was proven good. The kicker is, the guy had the gall to email and threatened to try to have me charged with fraud for the chargeback when he'd already sent the check. I simply responded and said hey, great to finally hear from you. Glad you're doing well, how's the baby? Listen, I'm sure there's just been a mix up and I'll be happy to pay everything just as soon I get the machine. I'm sure you understand why I want to receive it before I pay at this point. Of course, if you do want to call the police, you're welcome to explain to them how you attempted to defraud me by selling something you never possessed in the first place. Your call, never heard another word. I just hope his kid didn't have to go without diapers. Hey our word, this story takes place about 8 years ago, when I was in the 4th grade. Around the time when I was in 4th grade, I was diagnosed with a couple of different disorders, one of which being Asperger's syndrome. Because I had Asperger's, my family decided to file with the school district for something called an IEP, or an individualized education plan. This plan was supposed to help teachers understand how they can help their students succeed. At the same time, I was also a very gifted student, and therefore was part of the gifted program at my school. There was only one teacher for each grade of the gifted program. The fourth grade teacher's name was Ms. B. Ms. B was not exactly known for her warm-heartedness. Instead, it was common knowledge among students that Ms. B only acted favorably to the students that she personally liked, most of which were girls. There were two boys in the entire class, myself, and someone we will call Owen. Ms. B was very unkind to Owen and I, going as far as to get us suspended for taking too long in the restroom. This story begins on the first day of school. I came into the class, and we all had a nice little fourth grade introduction. Ms. B introduced herself, and everything seemed to be going swimmingly, until Ms. B decided to out me in front of everyone. She told the class all about my IEP, and about how I was special. She also told the class that about the disability that I had. The whole class had a jolly old time laughing at my expense. After that, my school life became a living hell. Teasing me was all but condoned by Ms. B, and the whole class including herself took part. The two worst memories that I have of Ms. B were the following. The first was a day when Ms. B decided that I looked down on people, and decreed that I was only to crawl on my belly in class. Being a young man with Asperger's, I did not tell my parents about this, because I thought for some strange reason that they would love me less if they knew about all of this. Strange autistic reasoning, I guess, the second memory of Ms. B's tyranny is one of my most painful memories. I was reading a book in the back of the class. Being autistic, I tend to get lost in books, and the outside world fades away. Apparently, Ms. B tried calling my name once, and when I didn't answer, she hatched a devious plan. From across the room, at the top of her lungs, she shouted hey our word. Unfortunately for me, I looked up, and responded with a meek yes? The whole class laughed and laughed for what felt like forever. Ms. B thought that she had her entire bullying scheme set out before her, and that I would do nothing in response. Wasn't it a shame that the school had recently installed new cameras in every room, because of theft problems? Ms. B had a jolly time bullying me, and I grinned and bore it, because I knew her atonement was coming. Finally, when she decided to reiterate to the class about my disability, my plan finally worked. I used my IEP granted coping mechanism, and left the room to talk with the counselor. I spent the entire afternoon explaining the abuse that I had taken from Ms. B, and told the counselor that the cameras would prove it. Lo and behold, the cameras proved my point. Ms. B lost her job, and the district paid for me to go to a nice boarding school for kids on the spectrum. I may have had Asperger's, but that doesn't mean I was an idiot, contrary to what Ms. B thought. Unfortunately for her, I knew what a civil rights lawsuit was. Doubly unfortunate for her is the fact that she now helps pay for my college. I spent two years in court for only $2. I was walking home after staying at work really late. Walking through the bar scene, I saw a cab and was so tired I decided to take it home. The first time I'd ever decided to do so. Short, aggressive ride where he's tailgating, honking, swearing, and aggro as duck despite it being a sleepy city. Fair, $6.40. I give him $20 and ask for $12 back. Cabby gives me $10 from a giant wad of money and says sorry, he doesn't have any ones. Okay, dude thinks I'm intoxicated because he picked me up outside of a bar, and he thinks he deserves a better tip even though the ride was like 3 minutes. I say, what do you mean you don't have any ones, you're a cabby, and I just saw your giant wad of cash. He persists. I say no. You're driving me down the street to that pizza shop and we're getting change. He says he won't. When I ask, he refuses to give me his name, and then gives me a menacing get the F out of my cab, looking like he's going to punch me in the face. Dude's definitely a tough guy and pretty scary, think short, stocky henchman type with buzz silver hair and a leather jacket, so I leave, but not before catching his cab number as he speeds off. Okay, it's the principle of the matter. This guy's doing this to intoxicated kids all night, and probably making a lot of money by intimidating and victimizing these customers of a public service. Duck that, I call the cab company and get my full $10 back, but it takes a bunch of harassment and several months to finally get it. Duck that, I call the cab company's director, who couldn't care less and who flat out told me he believed the cabbie's story over mine so not only is this crap happening, but it's being enabled and the complaints aren't being registered. 
F that especially. I tell him that if he doesn't take any course of action whatsoever then I'd be forced to take it up with the city's transportation oversight commission that oversees all this stuff. He basically dares me to do so. Okay, so I enter into this ridiculously arduous process, where after reading up on the local laws I write a major complaint to the public commission and request they be fined under certain articles. A couple months later I get a response letter. Cab company hires this sleazy ass lawyer who claims I'm lying about everything and had all this malicious intent. Claims I demanded once, and the cabbie didn't immediately procure them but then did seconds later, and at that point I was so fuming mad that I wanted to exact revenge. Calls my character and credibility into question completely. The letter was so amateur and there were so many transparent lies in it that it was both laughable and sad. So I go to my preliminary hearing, which I took to mean was just like filling out paperwork, or at most a private deposition or something. Nope, everyone's there, including the cabbie, the bedraggled secretary who sent my refund, the cab company's director, the sleazy lawyer, a court reporter, and a judge. Ridiculous cheap suits all around for the cab entourage. The in-person sleaziness of the lawyer did not disappoint think bad pinstripe suit and pink tie, slicked back hair, and pencil mustache, all resting on a sweaty and anxious fat man whose only apparent mode in trial is a combination of snideness and faux suspicion. The cabbie's giving me threatening looks during the whole thing, and I'm frankly a little scared he's going to kick my ass afterward. As a bonus, the judge is relatively young, extremely polite, thoughtful, level-headed, and patient. We give our stories. Cabby gives this really terribly acted story of how I intimidated him into getting more ones, become furious, etc. But he can't even keep his facts together and keeps stumbling over his obviously rehearsed lines. Sleazy lawyer tries to poke holes in my very simple and coherent story like it's a Hardy Boys novel. It was dark, you couldn't have seen the denominations of his money. It's the cheesiest ducking thing you've ever seen. Meanwhile I'm trying to cross-examine him, while basically learning on the job how to be a hack lawyer at a crappy municipal hearing, and I even take a few jabs at the cabbie for lying on the stand that were met with various objections. You could cut the tension between me and this cabbie with a knife, and I made a lot of awkward mistakes because of that, but overall it went pretty well. A funny mistake I remember is that the lawyer made some objection, and I butted in and said that's not even a good point, and the judge cracked a smile in agreement and then told me me I could not be subjective during the hearing. Judge makes a ruling a few months later, noting that the cabbie was clearly not credible, and orders cab company to pay a $1,500 civil penalty to the city for various infractions, fraud, not providing reasonable service, and not identifying himself, if I recall. Sweet, I think. But then, months later, lawyer issues an exception to this ruling, which I didn't know could occur, at around 9 p.m. the night it's due. The exception brings up all these reasons that they shouldn't be fined, for example, there was precedent for this fine before, and also attacks my credibility once again regarding details of the story, basically threatening to undo the ruling if I didn't respond. I get notice of this filing via email and frantically write up an official response to exceptions, which was required to address these issues, and I submit it just under midnight. Months later, I think a total of 1.5 years since the incident after several filings and correspondences, judge examines the new material and rules that the $1,500 fine stands. Got any ones now, butthole? After today, I'm leaving everything behind with no trace. I just can't do it anymore and I want it out. I am a 31 year slash O male and are married to a 29 year slash O female. We've been together for 10 years now and been though a lot of rough patches but always made it out on top. We have a 1 year slash O and she is beautiful as could be. My wife and I fight a lot I yell, cuss and never have anything nice to say. I don't know why I'm this way. I truly don't deserve her which is why I feel we argue and I feel she feels stuck with me. I show love by what I can provide for my family. While she shows love by how much she can care for our family we see things on such a different level I don't think it will ever work, we've been though years of therapy, and don't think I will ever work out. I am numb to feelings and really don't have any care for people. I started an IT company when I was 20 and grew it to a very successful company, won't go into details, but if I choose to not work ever again I could. Well one of my workers a 34 years slash OF and I started talking and it lead to an affair which has been going on for the last year and half which ultimately lead to more females that I had affairs with. I have no feelings for these women just enjoy how they don't seem to have feelings for me. My wife has zero clue but I cannot keep lying to her and I can't bring it upon myself to tell her. I work so much my daughter doesn't know who I am easily 80 plus hours a week I lay her down when she goes to bed but that's about it. I have set up her future that no matter my decision she will be set for life and will never have to work if she so chooses. I've contacted my lawyers around two months ago and set up my company to go majority in my wife's name and a small percentage in my daughter's name. Against my lawyer's advice, I bought some assets for my daughter that my wife doesn't know about and the profits of those assets will be put into a bank account that she will have access to when she gets older. I promoted one of my top workers to be the CEO and feel he will do a great job in that role so my wife won't tank the company. I took a little bit of money out of my company and plan on getting out of country and starting a new life in about a week. I am informing Reddit about this because I watch this thread on Snapchat a lot and they give good advice on stuff like this. This was not my wife's fault nor my daughter's fault and feel they don't deserve how I act or who I became. I'm giving them the option out they deserve, before hurting them any further. I confronted my wife with some advice from this post, the comments are right and just leaving was not the answer. We both are in agreement with this decision we think it's best for our family, I said we argue and our arguments normally end in her telling me just to leave.
We moved her parents in the house right next to ours around a year ago because of how absent I was and she wanted help. We discussed that an absent father was a better option than a father that neglects her. She thanked me for my decision and how we talked about the situation. She did on the other hand ask that if I leave, I will stay gone we don't want confusion later in life and I agreed. I don't know what she will say about me or what happened but honestly I don't mind. I know in the future I will most likely come to regret this decision. This could be the biggest mistake I could make but as for right now I can't see it as that. I see the damage I'm already doing in my house and feel they both do not deserve this. Tomorrow I will be leaving to start my new venture and now my wife will be able to start hers without being stuck around someone as toxic as I was.